morning, everybody. Um, we are about to start our live stream today. Um, we'll start at 8 a.m. Central Time. Um, so hold on for a few minutes there and um, we'll connect back again. So see you in a few minutes. Good morning again. Uh, welcome to the virtual 2020 AOCS annual meeting and expo live stream. My name is Silvana Martini. I'm a professor at Utah State University. And uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Alejandro Marangoni, um, who will uh, provide a comprehensive overview of the edible oil trade consumption and human health. Dr. Marangoni is a professor and tier one Canada research chair in food, health and aging at the University of Guelph in Canada. Uh, his work concentrates on the physical properties of lipidic materials in foods, cosmetics and biolubricants. He is a recipient of many awards, including the 2013 AOCS uh, Stephen Chang Award, the 2014 IFT Chang Award in Lipid Science, the 2014 AOCS Supelko Nicholas Pellick Award, the 2015 ISF Kaufman Medal, the 2017 AOCS Alton Bailey Medal, and the 2019 European Lipid Technology Award from Eurofet Lipids. Dr. Marangoni is a fellow of the American Old Chemist Society, the Institute of Food Technologists, and the Royal Society uh, of Chemistry in the UK. Dr. Marangoni was honored as one of the 10 most influential Hispanic Canadians in 2012 and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, the National Academy of Sciences in 2018. Today's presentations will focus on the current and future trends affecting the oil trade and will also review the possible effects that excessive or insufficient oil consumption can have on health. Questions from the live stream discussion will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. We look forward to the discussion and to uh, answering some questions. So thank you for joining us. And with that, I will turn the time over to Alex. Thank you, Alex, for being here. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Martini, and thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, welcome everybody to this live stream, the brave new world of conferences. So um, today I'm going to try to give you a bit of an overview on the brave new world of, uh, of fats and oils and where are we going. And I had a lot of fun, as you can see, putting in all these uh, stickers on the, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on, on the first page. We have here, uh, very important on the right hand side, the Responsible Palm Oil Initiative um, that is happening right now. It's, uh, you know, palm oil that has been grown without uh, habitat destruction, uh, more sustainably grown. 
Um, they're trying to certify that so that uh, that decreases a bit the modern concerns about about uh, about habitat destruction and, and oil production. We also have the in the middle here the dairy free and no animal products, the big initiatives for cruelty free and <clears throat> animal free products, the vegan movement, if you want to call it. But as well, in the two edges, we have this butterfly made with an oleo gel and the nanostructure of an oleo gelling system, which which looks very different to a fat crystal network, but it's still considered a fat. So every every all these moving pieces happening right now. And if you read Inform, which by the way, I must congratulate AOCS, Inform is looking better and better and better every issue. I do not know who's doing what, but the editor in chief and the AOCS staff need to be congratulated. It's one of the best magazines with a balance of industry and science in it. I, I highly suggest you read it. And um, some of the modern trends are, are there too. What does the consumer want? So the problem is that in the world as a, a, as a whole, as we know recently, is a, where are we going? And at least COVID has, a lot, has made us, whether we want it or not, stop. And at least hopefully everybody will have a little bit of time to, because maybe they're bored or they don't have anything else to do, is to think, where are we going as, as a species, as, as, a, as a society? And some may argue that we're going to hell. Um, I think we were going to hell. So maybe we can uh, use this opportunity to try to stop a little bit this, uh, this momentum towards Dante's Inferno and, uh, and maybe try to be a little bit better citizens of the world. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know. But I mean, let me talk to you about some trends. And this is some of the, the, the worrying images, right, of us rapidly running towards our like self-annihilation. On the um, upper left-hand side corner, you have uh, the production of palm oil in many of the uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, um, which is fine. We all have to produce agricultural crops in the background of smoke, the famous smoke of the burning fields of Indonesia um, that, that, that at certain times of the year when the farmers clear the land, fill the air. And uh, you have months sometime in which uh, like large parts of the country and even into Singapore, uh, you get smoke. And it's terrible for air pollution. And uh, and here is what is happening. People are clearing rainforests for more palm oil plantations. These were once native forests where like wildlife, like rhinoceros lives, where the famous orangutan here in the middle uh, lives. And those are absolutely, well, they have been wiped out in the past. Um, not to say we wiped out all our forests here and put crops in, soybeans and and, and, and corn and all those things. So, I mean, we're not innocent. It's just that uh, we, we don't have any more forests. So all the rainforests are, are there and they're like the lungs of the planet. So uh, it's a little bit too bad to tell somebody that they cannot increase their economic activity by having more crops. But on the other, on the other hand, are we gonna burn down the entire Amazon as it's happening right now to put in soybeans to feed the cows? or to produce more primary agricultural crops. We must find a balance. We cannot just wipe everything out. Um, and so we shouldn't stand on a soapbox. We should work together towards finding a solution for this. So habitat destruction is a very big one and people have reacted very strongly against palm oil because it's identifiable, right? It's all there, they're destroying the rainforest and uh, you can point a finger, but we should be pointing our fingers ourselves too what we're doing with regular crops in lands that used to be forests at one point. On the right-hand side here, you can see the issue that PETA and other groups that are animal activists come um, uh, like bring forward is the fact that we have mass production of food. We need this mass production in order to keep prices low and also to be able to, su to, to supply the enormous amount of people that live in the world. So we should not forget that too. It's not that they're evil or something, they're trying to produce uh, things efficiently so that everybody can uh, benefit from it, uh, both from a uh, supply of food, food, food security, as, and as well as the people who do this are invest, I mean, are business people, so they have to make some money and a livelihood as well. But the conditions are not the best for the animals. So here you have this mass production of pigs, and of course they're treated as machines, right? Or disposable things that grow for a very short period of time and then they're sacrificed. So meat and the fat that comes from the meat, then you have chickens as well. And then you have uh, the dairy production, which needs to be as well um, uh, made efficient in high levels, but extremely hard on both sustainability 
and uh, and on the animal cruelty side, if you want to call it like that, animal use, it's not, I don't know no, whether to call it ethical because that's pretty heavy. So what do we do with all of this that is happening in the world right now? I mean, it's a really interesting question. And the consumer then gets also all this fragmented information that exacerbates certain aspects of it. So we, we don't have a global view on it. We react to our emotions seeing these pictures, for example, an orangutan, a burning forest, but we have it completely out of context or the animals. It's completely out of context. We think that some evil person is putting pigs in a room because they want to. But uh, it, it, it just, just doesn't work like that. So information is also very important. So what can we do it? And I have here um, the balance between like ethics. I should have put another thing in terms of also um, supplying sufficient food. But can we do something in the realm of ethics and law? Should we all work together towards making this a little bit uh, more uh, friendly? So um, the future of fats and oils. Um, I, I think that this is the way that we're going to go, and we have to really address it. And Mark Kellens had very interesting comments in the latest inform, one of the recent informs about what the consumer is looking for. So, for example, highly sustainable production. And that's what the palm oil people have really, really. I attended the uh, MPOB conference in, uh, in Malaysia last fall, and they were huge on responsible palm oil production. They have turned the page. And to them now, it's a priority that all the plantations produce this responsible, this RS, RSO, responsible palm oil. Um, um, and, uh, and, and with that, they have to uh, abide by very, by very strict criteria in which they would not destroy any primary forests. They would use existing lands and all those things. So highly sustainable production, um, you have to start calculating the low energy, uh, lower water. We consume a lot of water with crops, right? Organic, a lot of people shy away from the use of pesticides and herbicides. So as organic as possible, crop rotation, so we don't destroy the soil. And, and that goes along with soil com, com conservation. And all of this leads to a lower carbon footprint. Now this has to be combined. So that's from an efficiency and production perspective, very low to zero habitat destruction. At this point, I think we should say zero habitat destruction. I spend most of my life in the outdoors and we don't have much outdoors, much natural world left. So you have to use marginal lands. So no more financing your plantation from cutting the primary forest. That, that's, that needs to be done. Um, green extraction and minimal processing, very exciting for people like us who work in the fats and oils area. Green extraction, and again, in one of the latest informs, maybe in the future, all the extraction of oil will be due by hydraulic pressing. We will, have, uh, we will not have really hexane extractions anymore, which brings up a lot of questions about efficiencies and as well, um, utilization of everything that is in the crop. So it may, it may be a problem because then you have to produce more, right? Because you're extracting less. However, expellers are gonna be and are coming back in, in force um, and minimal processing. Uh, people maybe do not wanna have something that is a refined bleach deodorized anymore. Um, we have to uh, maybe look at ways of uh, pure, uh, like refining the oils that maintain the nutritional value, do not remove many of the micronutrients in, in there. So expelling and then, for example, give an example, instead of neutralizing with sodium hydroxide, you neutralize with calcium hydroxide and you preserve phytosterols and tocopherols 25, 30% more. Uh, we have done some work in this area and it's actually quite exciting to see how you can change refining just a little bit and preserve the nutritional quality of, of the oil. And, and the consumer will understand that. And I think that that's where we're going. So that leads us to enhanced nutritional properties. The oil that we eat then can compete in image and in effect with olive oil, right? Olive oil is just pressed and it, we like it because it's green and contains all those micronutrients that are gonna make us live forever and look forever young. And, uh, and get less uh, cardiovascular disease, all those good things. So, and, and, the, and the consumer again understands the enhanced nutritional properties. So I think from a, from a sustainability uh, perspective, um, a, a more sustainable product, a more green product, uh, something that has a low carbon footprint is the way to go. And something that also enhances our, our nutrition so that we have a strong immune system so we can fight COVID or something like that. Now, uh, there's a segment of the population that feels very strongly about animals. 
And so, I mean, we're fine. We can produce fats and oils from plant sources. So animal free. Um, there's even a subsection of those people who do not want to have even dairy cows in there. Um, I drink milk products. I think it can be done in a sustainable and animal and cruelty free fashion. Maybe uh, I'm looking very hard for grass fed, free ranging cows. But on the other hand, then you need more land, right? So you're going to be uh, having a problem with your carbon footprint and water consumption because you need more land for it. So complicated, uh, but, uh, but something to address all the milk fats all the milk fat related products, butter um, and creams and things like that, that we work on, uh, can we make them dairy free? Um, now, everything I talked about raises the price of production and will raise the price of the consumer. So there has to be some fundamental economic differences in the way we do things. So next point, we need to have new fully integrated supply chains, no middlemen. Because every time you have somebody in the middle, the price goes up. Everybody has to have a margin, right? So um, anybody who produces anything is very annoyed with distributors and secondary people who and the, the retail stores. Everybody takes a margin. So if you're going to increase the price because the price is going to increase by being a good citizen, then you have to integrate the supply chain. And so remove the middleman. Um, now, the efficiency in your production then has to be judged by a combination of factors, not only cost. You cannot solely say, I can produce this in the cheapest way possible. So who's gonna judge it? I mean, the real cost of producing that takes into consideration uh, both the environmental cost and as well uh, the animal um, cost um, needs to come into play. And I think that's gonna be a battle for the market in the marketplace because it doesn't really have a, a money value, right? But maybe the consumer will, will establish that value by buying the products that are both sustainable, animal cruelty-free, enhanced nutritional um, for a bit of a higher price. So the absolute low cost, which is what has been driving oil production and, and production of most food uh, cannot just be based on the lowest possible cost, it cannot because that's not really the real cost. Um, now, maybe this will lead for companies that have managed to do all of this and integrate the supply chain, higher margins for them due to the integration of production. So those two things have to come in together and production and distribution. Um, and maybe the governments will jump in and legally mandate environmental and maybe animal uh, considera uh, considerations. So the government needs to come down with regulations that force, in a way, everybody to be a good citizen. And then because of these fundamental changes and everything is integrated, maybe the companies will make more money. So that at this point, they would say, if we do all of this that you just talked about there, the price would double. And that would be, that's, that doesn't work very well, right? Uh, but however, if you, if you change the way that you establish your supply chains, it may be actually beneficial in the end and we all win. So complicated, but all these factors need to be taken into account, I think, in the brave new world of fats and oils. And the writing is on the wall. Look, cow's milk, everybody now, is, is it's huge, the trend towards plant-based milks, right? Soy milks, almond milks, other milks, they're horrible nutritionally. But, um, but again, these now are emulsions of oils from uh, from crops like almonds for from nuts or or soybean or actually there's a milk for everything uh, even though I think the nutrition needs to be improved a lot of people working on artificial cheese yogurt ice cream um, again huge opportunity for fats and oils in this frozen category here replacing ice cream with the coconut based things the coconut based dairy desserts but the writing is on the wall I mean look how big the trend is even in these areas here um, and animal fats are not really an option anymore. Uh, a bit of fun with, uh, with, uh, with my, with my uh, diagram here. Uh, young uh, Shiva Maharaj uh, fights the butchers that want to take the cows. The cows are holy for the Hindu people in, in India. The, the Jews and the Muslims don't eat pork. So all the fat derived products that came from that, the lard made for your pie. It's not a good thing anymore. It comes from an animal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So animal fats are really not an option, not as much as a problem for us uh, who work with plant-based systems, but many people that work with animal fats, working with, back with animal fats 
in, 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 the, in the greater consumption of society, not in the specialized little areas, may not be an option. And as we become more aware of animal cruelty issues, maybe there won't be an option at all. So now we talked about oils, but what about is, what is the problem with fats? There's ample supplies of plant-based oils which can fulfill modern economic and ethical requirements. So economic and ethical, we have to work about, we'll talk about both. But the problem is that it's not enough hard fat around uh, for the for required for the functionality in industrially processed food products. So what are the hard fats in the world that we could just fill a ship with? So cocoa butter, there really is limited supply, it's very high cost, and it's limited functionality. It's great for chocolate, but it, it doesn't work as the best baking fat, right? And everything tastes like cocoa butter, like chocolate. We don't want to have chocolate everything. Um, shea butter comes from the, the tree, a tree in Africa as well, collected in an artisanal fashion by hand. And um, it, it, it's similar to cocoa butter, it's a confectionery fat. There's not nearly enough supply of these things. It's a very high cost. And again, like cocoa butter, limited functionality. Coconut oil, interesting. Again, more supply, well, who knows, than cocoa butter and shea butter, but it's also high cost. It's been used in all the plant-based vegan burgers, and it's used as the fat in plant-based foods quite a bit. Limited functionality, it has a low smoke point. It breaks down, it hydrolyzes a little bit more, uh, more than the longer chain fatty acids. And, and really, the, if you look at the cell effect content temperature profile of coconut oil, I mean, it, it's limited. I mean, you, it's not really a hard fat. It's like an almost hard fat. Now, uh, palm oil, there's an enormous supply. There's very good functionality. We learn how to work with palm oil. Low ethical score, maybe that can be improved, but palm oil, and it's the most efficient per hectare plant that produces oil. So the amount of oil per hectare that the palm oil produces beats everybody by like five times. So from a, a productivity point of view, palm oil wins. Now, the low ethical score and the reaction of many countries against palm oil is surprising to me. And uh, I hope that they can turn it around with the responsible palm oil initiatives. Um, I don't know, I hope they can do because it fulfills many of the, uh, of the aspects that we would like in many, not all uh, that we are talking about. And animal fats, just forget it. Now, so what about, so here we have this. So we have a lot of oils that are there. So what are we going to do with the oils? The oils have limited functionalities for baking, for other applications. What about um, um, fat mimetics? Notice how I'm not talking about oleogels. I'm talking about fat mimetics. Uh, fat mimetics are materials made from oils that are liquid, and, um, and they have the functionality and the rheological properties of a fat. So they're hard. They're semi, they have all those physical properties associated with a fat. What would be the motivation? A decreased saturated fat content, which is always, which is number one for decreasing cardiovascular disease. Uh, control of lipid digestion. I'll show you very quickly that you can actually control the digestion of lipids using oleogels. You can remove hydrogenated fat and partially and fully hydrogenated fat. It addresses issues of veganism, cruelty-free products, uh, and religious beliefs. Muslims don't, don't, don't eat no, any hard, Hindus, no tallow, and the vegans, no animal fat, all the religions in one, in one line. And, and it's palm oil free for those people who want that, um, the, that has issues with sustainability, natural forest destruction, and uh, you can use locally grown oils. And you can also have small scale manufacture. So this is an overview of, um, of, of these. And um, I'm gonna jump to one of the last ones after this because we're gonna run out of our 20 minutes, but let's just spend a little bit of time uh, on these and I will not go into any specific example as I was planning to do. You can see it in my slides, but let's just talk about this. So fat mimetics, not all your gels, fat mimetics like the fat mimetics of the 50s. So you can make, let's say an emulsion, right? Stabilized by some hydrocolloid here on the left-hand side, either a polysaccharide or a protein, you make the emulsion, then you dry it. And now that's your fat. Um, our, our great colleague who recently passed away, Ashok Patel, was a star, a star in that area. He knew how to do this extremely well. Solvent exchange, protein hydrogels, polysaccharide hydrogels that you actually exchange with the solvent evaporate of the solvent or you just dry down uh, the, the, the work of Elke Scholten there in Wageningen. Very, very interesting stuff. What about the central one? Direct oil gelation. That's what we associate with a fat mimetic or an oleo gel. There you add a compound that just gels the oil. So you have the small molecule gelators like uh, 
monoglycerides, diglycerides, waxes, alcohols, hydroxylated fatty acids, mixtures thereof, you know, all the hydroxysteric acid stuff, all those clear things that look like jello. And the polymer, direct gelators like chitin and ethocellulose that form these polymer networks. Again, a jelly, a jello, a transparent jello of oil. And what about structure by phasic systems in which we can include now all the emulsions and hard emulsions, structured emulsions. So we're not limited to oil gelation. We're limited to, we're not limited to oil gelation. We're just limited by the functional physical properties of the material. So you can take a liquid oil and convert it into a fat. So if maybe if we use a liquid oil, we can address all the issues of animal cruelty, sustainability, and turn it into a modern fat product uh, via any of these, um, many of these techniques here. And then um, I was gonna give you the example of ethyl cellulose um, and the applications in meat products. The only thing I would like to mention here at the end of this is the fact that one of those oil gels, uh, we did a great work with Heya Henry from the National University of Singapore. And uh, we fed people uh, 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 rice porridge with a ton of ethyl cellulose oil gel, coconut oil gel. And then we checked out what happened in their body. And notice this curve here at the lower right-hand side corner. This is the lipid profile in the serum of young Chinese men, no women, no old people. And no, 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 no. So, so basically they, they took some graduate students around there. And, uh, and look at when you feed um, the, the people the 40 grams of coconut oil, the lipid profile, you, you see the triglycerides rising and then coming down uh, in time, typical of taking a lot of fat. Now, if you have a rice porridge without any fat, you don't see that lipid going up in your blood, the serum triglycerides. Now, if you add it as an oleo gel of a specific molecular weight and concentration, look, that is the blue line. You see only a very little increase, almost no increase. So you've modulated, you have a controlled release of lipids in, or triglycerides into your bloodstream, which is extremely exciting. And maybe you can do a little bit better. You can modulate that. Well, depending on a lot of factors, but one of the exciting things you can do with all your gels in a, for a health situation. So in a, in a postprandial situation, you have lower serum triglyceride levels, which are markers of cardiovascular disease. And you've addressed that. For example, one of the things that these fat mimetics can do. So final perspectives. Um, in oleo gels and fat mimetics, mixtures thereof are much more effective than single components. Find new polymer oleo gelators that are more uh, friendly, not so synthetic. Force triglycerides to behave like small molecules oleo gelators. Kiyotako Sato, Sato showed us that with beta gels. You can make triglycerides behave like oleo gels. Uh, find solutions that will be commercially viable. You have to be reasonable uh, in terms of regulation and supply. There has to be enough supply. Um, and uh, maybe work on near nature versions of the fat structuring strategies. With that, I would like to, to thank the funding agencies, NSERC, uh, the Canada Research Chair Program, Industrial Partners, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, uh, for the presentation. That's uh, very interesting as usual, very inf informative. Um, we do have uh, one question to start with. Uh, so I'm going to remind the participants, they can ask questions and we will read them and Dr. Marangoni will answer those. So the first question is, do you think that palm oil has been unfairly targeted as a cause of rainforest destruction while logging and other types of farming have been largely, largely ignored? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, uh, they, they, because they're an identifiable target. <laughs> uh, Southeast Asia, palm oil plantation, you can take photographs because Asians are very organized. They have a beautiful plantation and, and roads and you can take photographs. Um, uh, but I, I also, yes, absolutely. And we don't talk, it's interesting. It's very interesting to point a finger and to say, look, they're bad. But I look outside here and I see a lot of environmental destruction. Sorry, Silvana, but you go to Argentina and the whole pampas that have been destroyed for soybean production, it's absolutely catastrophic. I mean, it's done, right? It's just that you're doing it now and you can take a picture with a satellite. So yeah, I think it's completely unfair. But, 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 I think the Malaysian palm oil industry and, and the other has, was not proactive enough, early enough to start these campaigns. I think maybe they were too proud or they said, don't bother me, please, you did it. You know, and that was not enough. I think 
uh, the, the 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 population had to be informed of the fact that our there are initiatives and this responsible palm oil thing, which is great, is coming. I'm not saying a little bit late, but it's um, it, there's going to be a little work to do in order to show that you're good environmental citizens of the world. Yeah, absolutely. But why? Because it's happening now. You can take a picture of it and you can point a finger, and it's a rainforest, right, with animals in it. I mean, it's perfect to um, to um, to land a bomb on. So um, uh, a little unfair, but not totally innocent, right? I mean, maybe you, they should have started with the environmental uh, knowing what is coming down. It started a little earlier with a responsible palm oil uh, initiative. Yeah. Great, thank you. Perfect answer. Um, we have another question and he says, is coconut oil safe and nutritive? That means nutritious for humans? Ooh. I mean, I, I, just to give you an anecdote, I remember talking to a doctor and, um, and the doctor was always joking, asking, so what is, like, what does it mean that a food makes me healthy or it's a healthy food? I mean, what, I mean, well, you don't die when you eat it. It's not a poison. I mean, it, think about it. What exactly does it mean that the food is healthy? Um, however, so coconut oil, I think it's, I mean, how much coconut oil are you going to eat? That always comes down to that, right? But uh, yeah, if you're gonna eat like five kilograms of coconut oil per day, you're probably not gonna be doing very well. Now, remember the shorter chain fatty acids, um, especially lauric acid, there's a lot lauric acid. If you look at the cholesterol raising effects of the C12, it's very high. Even though, even though then you get into arguments like the high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, the ratio between the two doesn't look too bad. However, the C12 fatty acid is incredibly effective at raising your low density lipoprotein. So if you're asking me about that, eating too much of it is probably not a good idea just because you're raising your overall cholesterol, particularly the LDL. And yes, you can talk about ratios, but if you have high cholesterol and you're raising it even further, then having anything that raises your cholesterol is bad. That's the point about saturated fats. They raise your cholesterol. Now, if you have 250 milligrams per deciliter of, of cholesterol levels, anything that raises your cholesterol is bad. Now, if you're within a, a, a healthy range, then you can talk about the ratios, right? It's Again, you, you have to be normal about this. Um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with coconut oil. How much are you eating uh, is, 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 a, is a good question. Thank you, Alex. Next question says, how about essential fatty acids from fish oil? Can we have all your gelation technique with uh, fish oil? Oh, that person has been pulling their hair like I have. Uh, you have to heat up usually oils. I think that you would have to stick not to something like an ethyl cellulose oleo gel, which you have to go to 140 degrees to disperse anything that is a cold a cold system. So I think that in an oleo gel with a low amount of silver wax, or, um, or, or, or anything that, that gels the oil directly in, uh, in um, let's say an oil, a direct oil gelator, something that you, need, that you only need to heat up a little bit, you would still have to uh, address all the issues of antioxidants. They would have to be heavily laden antioxidants. <clears throat> they would have to treat it like the oil. Don't expect the oleo gel really to solve the oxidation and stability problem. You, you really have to be good at antioxidants. Uh, I mean, you may get a marginal improvement in, in oxidative stability, but that has always been the issue with the long chain fatty acids. Uh, look at all the supplements, 80%, 90% of the supplements that you eat in those gelatin gels are all oxidized. So, um, so I mean, they don't know how to do it. Uh, you shouldn't really be eating oxidized oils. So, um, so again, that's a question more for the antioxidant people. The oleo gels are not gonna solve that problem, but if you have to use an oleo gel, use a structuring strategy that is uh, lower temperature for direct oil gelation. Now, if you use an emulsion template approach, then you have an emulsion, then you can maybe protect it within an emulsion droplet and you have the antioxidants in there, but it would be like having an emulsion. So again, we go back to the antioxidants that you, that you use. So unfortunately, no, there's no magic cure to the oxidation of long chain fatty acids in all your gels. Thank you, Alex. Um, the next question goes back to palm oil. Uh, how could sustainable palm, palm oil be traced? How could fraud uh, could be avoided or identified? Excellent question, right? I mean, how, how do we believe that it really is responsible palm oil? Um, you would have to have a whole infrastructure 
uh, and maybe, you know, when they do trade of meats, they have inspectors, right? So they have inspections, a federally inspected facility in Canada too. You would almost have to have that. And then <clears throat> you must not only have that federally inspected facility within a country, but did you know that countries collaborate like the USDA and the, um, and the, and the United States and Health Canada or Agriculture Canada, they have very, very good programs in which they share the information. So the meat that comes from Canada or the US uh, can be traced and, and they know exactly uh, where it comes from and what has happened to that meat. It would almost have to be like that. You would have to have cooperation between, between countries. Or you create an organization that is international that, that certifies that, that can happen. Because if the countries don't wanna to talk to each other, then you have a problem, right? But an international certifying agency uh, imagine this Greenpeace certified responsible palm oil. Uh, I don't know, unless the Greenpeace people can be bribed or something, uh, you would uh, you would trust them, right? You would trust because they're extremists on the other side, right? So they say, yeah, that's good, that's fine, or the World Wildlife Fund or the United Nations. Uh, well, maybe I don't know about them, but I mean somebody like that is environmentally oriented that would uh, certify. Um, I think that's the only way to do it is to have an independent third party, right? Yeah, like uh, in cocoa, the fair trade, right? Or not fair, only fair trade cocoa. Fair trade, yeah, perfect, yeah. Um, we have uh, another question about oleo gels. Uh, what is the situation of oleo gels production and marketing now? Ah, so here's the truth about oleo gels. Nobody tells you that one, they can be more expensive. They're relatively expensive in terms of uh, the compound, but not as expensive in terms of processing. So if you already have a plant that processes and crystallizes fats, well, you want to use your plant, right? But if you don't have it, then you can rely on the chemistry instead of the processing. I mean, how many people do you know that have large scale facilities and votators and, and pin workers and storage facilities to, to, to I mean, no. I mean, for all your gels, you usually need a, a vat. You heat it up, you know, you cool it down. Uh, it's very straightforward. So maybe a small scale production. Um, but secondly, so that's from a processing point of view, uh, they're, they're a little bit more expensive, the compound. There's limited supply, even with things that we think have a large supply. The, for example, waxes. You would think that there's a ton of waxes around, but there aren't. There would not be enough. If everybody made an oleo gel with waxes, I, there wouldn't be enough wax. It's, uh, it's a product using cosmetics. So you need to create a strategy that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is commercially viable in terms of supply. Lecithin could be a good one. There's a lot of lecithin around from all the refining of oils. Unless we start minimally processing all the oil, then there'll be no lecithin. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a situation there. And third, regulatory. Um, did you know that most waxes are not allowed? Let's say the United States, three waxes are allowed. Beeswax? Candelilla, and recently, rice bran wax. They're allowed because they're on the grass list. In Canada, candelilla, beeswax, no rice bran wax, no sunflower wax, no uh, sugar cake. So you can't do it. It's not on the grass list. And then the second thing is, for example, you have to ask permission to use it in oils at a certain level. Ethyl cellulose just got approval from the Food and Drug Administration. You can put it in oils at 5% level. So now you can make an oleo gel from ethyl cellulose. It's both on the grass list and, on the, uh, and, and allowed to be used as a thickener of oils. You, you got to have that permission because waxes are used as polishing agents to coat things. So you don't have permission to use. So somebody, companies need to ask for this permission. I don't understand why companies are not just asking for this. It took Dow seven years to get approval for ethyl cellulose, seven years. So spend a little money, wait for seven years. Thank you, Alex. I don't know how you're doing on time. We have the questions keep coming. So uh, um, you want I'm we can keep going? Are you okay? I'm fine, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, do you then think that rather than looking for other oil fat solutions, we should go towards fat mimetics? I think we should look for everything. I mean, I, I, you saw that big diagram I had. I mean, the fat mimetics include the straight oleogelators, the, the, the structured emulsions. So emulsions are, are interesting systems, right? So you see, now we don't have to be ashamed 
by calling an organogel or oleogel a structured emulsion color because people come out, hey, it has water. That's not an oleogel. Oleogels are anhydrous. And people scream at you and point fingers at conferences and call you stupid. Um, but no, now we can talk about fat mimetics. So everything is on the table. I always had that problem, but calling an emulsion oleogel, it's not really, right? But it is a fat mimetic. And fat mimetics, I, I didn't invent those things. Um, and they're, remember in the 50s, they used to have a part, microparticulated protein for ice cream. And it had the, 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 the creaminess of, uh, of, of a fat, even though it was just 20 micron size protein spheres. And uh, so why not? That can be a fat mimetic, but we're talking fats and oils here. So dried emulsions, uh, compounds that magically make oil gels, and, um, and, and structured emulsions that, are, that have water in them. All of them are fair game, I think. And maybe there'll be combinations. An oleo gel emulsion. So the inside oil is slightly gelled and you have a structured emulsion around it. Um, or um, an, a, an emulsion that you have an oleo gel inside already and you dry it down and that, be, that mush becomes, uh, becomes your fat. So no, everything. Let's do everything. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question says, uh, what do you predict will be the first commercially viable oil to be widely used as a fat mimetic in, and in what application? Um, I'm a little biased. So um, I, I think that, um, well, if you look from a cost benefit point of view, uh, uh, well, I mean, structured emulsions have been around. People have been baking with structured emulsions for a long time. I mean, be the, the, the emulsions that we developed or other people developed. I think emulsions uh, have been around for a long time. So I, I think that a hardened emulsion is a good way to go because you can have a, let's say, a monoglyceride, diglyceride that serves as the emulsifier. Those are inexpensive. Uh, they can be plant-based. So emulsions, I think, have the potential of being implemented very fast. And a lot of people know how to make emulsions and stabilize emulsions. So we're talking about high oil ratio emulsions, right? So we're talking about emulsions that have 50, 60% oil, you know, that kind of thing, 70% oil. Um, and as far as direct oil gelators, the one that is ahead of everybody for the moment is, uh, is ethyl cellulose because it has been approved. Even though the price is ridiculous, if you buy a kilogram of ethyl cellulose, you will be out about forty dollars a kilo, uh, and you can make an oil gel with me with four percent, four percent. So you, you do the math, right? I mean, it's still, I mean, it's still quite expensive from an ingredient point of view. The question is, can we learn from ethyl cellulose? Can we find a more natural source of a polymer like chitin? But chitin is from shrimp, so some, somebody's going to have a problem with that. Uh, from the cell wall of plant. I mean, that would be amazing, right? If somebody found a version of the cell wall of a plant that could function a little bit like uh, ethyl cellulose. Uh, so I think structured emulsions are the ones that are gonna, uh, so are, are gonna be the first ones to be out there. Yeah. Really related to that topic and, and to another question that uh, came up about availability of oleogelators. There's a question here and it's saying, how can we increase the oil gel's natural structure, that is the vegetable waxes, uh, production in a commercial, to be commercially available? It, it's totally doable. It's totally doable because for example, let me give an example. Uh, I mean, you know that better than me is rice bran wax. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, rice that is produced in the world. And the rice bran wax comes from the husk, the, the coat of the seed. Uh, and those are in many times, like yeah, I've seen them, they're burned for fuel. They're not really used. So you have to extract the oil from that waste material and then do winterization and get the wax out. So um, it would be a different proposition, right? Because right now it's being, it's being, it's being uh, extracted for pharmaceutical and uh, for pharmaceutical, for cosmetic applications, right? So very expensive, but that doesn't mean that uh, it cannot be maybe less purified and, uh, and done on a larger scale. So I, I do not see why waxes could not help, even though you'd be surprised, it's not a huge concentration of waxes even in those materials. Uh, there would have to be demand. Uh, the systems are in place to be able to extract and produce more waxes. Rice bran wax, I think is a really good one, uh, but sunflower wax is another one that is a waste product, a complete waste product. And it, it comes from sunflower oil. So those two would be highly available 
Um, Candelilla, I mean, as much as people like Candelilla, it comes from a cactus of the, Mex of the Mexican desert. It's not very sustainable. You're like killing some cactus. And Carnuba comes from a palm, right? A palm tree. And that's not really that sustainable. So I think rice bran wax and sunflower wax at higher levels. And then I'm not going to tell you about it, but, um, but there's combinations of waxes that enhance the, the, the functionality of waxes. Silvana has done some work on it. We had to get around her stupid, I mean, her paper uh, when we did our patent uh, because she already worked. There's combinations of waxes that have enhanced structuring. So you can, in a way, stretch the ability of a wax to, uh, to and, and maybe if you use it in combination, right? You do not need as much. If you gel the oil a little bit and then use another oleogelator, that's where the combinations of oleogelators will stretch the amount, right? That you need for, for these applications. Right. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the next question, but I'm going to read it. Maybe you understand it. So it says uh, about the rice porridge study, triacylglycerols had stability in bloodstream, but what about glucose? Is it better than regular flat fat? Nothing else moved. <laughs> the cholesterol levels didn't move. The glucose didn't move. Everything was, the satiety didn't move. So no extra satiety, no effect on carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, but remember, it was only monitored for like six hours. I don't know what happened because that, you're only allowed to bleed people for six hours. Um, but that's an excellent question. I mean, what does the sugar do? And what does the insulin do as well would be related to that. But no, there were no effects. So I think what's happening is that at a high molecular weight and with enough concentration, the oil, the lipase, is having a really hard time to get to the oil. I think it's a simple physical effect. So one thing that is lacking in that study, see what's coming out the other end of the people. I wonder if you get more gelled oil in your, in your feces. So basically it just doesn't have enough time. You know, there's a transit time, right? So it's just not being assimilated um, because that effect is not seen with a slightly lower molecular weight ethyl cellulose or, or even a lower concentration of the same uh, CP45, the higher molecular weights ethyl cellulose. So I think it's purely a physical effect. Right. The next question says, do you think microbial production of oils is a sustainable way to produce lipids? Do you know anything about microbial production of fats or would it be viable to fractionate SCOs? Uh, remind me about SCOs. Single, oh, single cell oils. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's exactly actually, you know what, um, I, I worked with a company called Solazyme out of uh, South San Francisco for many years and they had the microalgal platform and they could make any oil you wanted growing microalgae and it went quite far. Big growth and extraction facility, they used to grow them in big tanks uh, next to the sugar plantations in Brazil. So you feed them sugar and heterotropically they, they grow, not with the sun. If anybody tells you they're going to grow microalgae by putting sun on them, run away. Don't give them any money. You got to grow them in the tanks, feed them sugar in the dark, and they can make a ton of oil. Um, and, and it's not bad. The, you can do it. You can do it. But you need a lot of carbon. You need, you need sugar. You need something to feed them, right? Maybe you can learn how to feed them bagasse or like some waste product. So, uh, yes, single cell oils are good. Microalgae are particularly good. I think yeast as well. Both of them suffer of one gigantic problem. How do you break open the cells? And the efforts that the people at Solasine had to do in order to get, they had these French presses that are still down there. Now it's in the hands of Bungi. Uh, the largest French presses in the world, 20 ton bench, I and mean, they may be even bigger. Imagine a French press, super huge. And they were still had to, had to process the algal mass like crazy. They had to cook it. They had to, I don't know, jump on it. it it's just breaking the cell wall of both yeast and, uh, and, and algae is very difficult. And so extracting it is a challenge. The extraction plant doesn't look anything like a soybean extraction plant. So you have to develop new technologies, which could be quite energy intensive. But I, I really think that as long as it all works out, you have a good source of food for your yeast or your microalga, and you have developed, the yeast are another nightmare to break open. And a good way of breaking open the cells so you can extract the oil, it's going to be quite exciting. I, I think it's going to be quite exciting. Will they become, they would have to be a value added. They'll always be a little bit, I think, more expensive than a crop, but maybe you can create a, uh, an oil that is unique 
And that brings the question of GMO, right? So you can genetically modify to do whatever you want. Will the people consume GMOs? Big question mark. But uh, uh, let's say that you select a strain and you manage to get a natural strain that has been selected, then uh, I, I think it's an exciting, I think we're gonna, people used to work on yeast oils a long time ago. And uh, I think there's great potential for it, but we need more research in the area of extraction and refining. Thank you, Alex. Do you know if they've used uh, ultrasound to try to break those cells? Sorry, I have to ask that question. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that would be very exciting. I have not seen, I've seen the French press approach. Yeah. But then you're roasting your, your, your cell mass. You have to dry it, roast it, press mm -hmm. it. It's just, I, I don't know about that. Interesting. Uh, ultrasound would be yeah, really interesting. Because it's a typical, you know, cell disruption technique. So. Yeah, if, but implemented on a large scale. I don't know how much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, yeah. Great, thank you, Alex. Sorry, I had to chip in in there. <laughs> um, we have another question. What is your opinion concerning using formulation of oleogels as a gelator substance, for example, waxes, which have limitations in their maximum content in food products? Oh, completely. I keep on telling people, I think uh, I had a project recently on, uh, on, uh, on gelling a, a fancy oil and I managed to make the beautiful spread an oleo gel that would just everybody would buy it's not allowed it's not legal <laughs> so i mean I, I told the people you have to work on regulation and again you bring up an excellent point and i was mentioning it they're you they're grass but they're used as um polishing agents as coatings at very low amounts nothing that would help us as fats and oils nobody has asked for permission for using fats and oil it is illegal so somebody has to ask for permission I mean, I'm not going to do it, but some some eco, some company, Cargill or some big person like that, they should uh, they should ask, they should put in the the the, the dossier. There's enough information that it has no effects, and then they show that they can make a margin with it, and they have to wait their five to seven years until it gets approved. It, it will get approved. I'm a hundred percent sure of that. But I mean, somebody has to put in the petition. Yeah. Thank you. Um. We have a few more questions. Is that okay with you, Alex? I think we have two more. Sure. Uh, the next one is, uh, what would be, in your opinion, a good way to enhance the nutritional profile of a vegetable oil or fat, but complexifying it by complexifying its chemical composition? I do not know about the second half. Yeah of it but i wonder if it means using interest verification or, oh. or changing the chemical composition of the fat oh a million dollar question i love interest verification uh so you want to interest verify oh well, well don't hydrogenate <laughs> get that idea out of your head don't use animal products right i would use minimally processed oils like uh, an, an expeller pressed oil that contains very high levels of uh, phytosterols tocopherols other micronutrients um, there's other exciting ones, phenolic lipids, like phenols, like antioxidant that are esterified onto fatty acids. Like we destroy those like crazy when we do bleaching and they are all gone. We were looking into this. There's a lot of micronutrients in there. So just don't touch it. I mean, extract it in a, in a way that you create an oil that has all that nutritional enhancement, characterize that nutritional enhancement, that, that nutritional value. I think people will be very interested in all the extra vitamins and, and micronutrients and hopefully not too many pesticides. So it's gotta be or, organic, right? Uh, what you're doing. And then uh, interest verification is viable, but you're gonna have to do it with, um, with an enzyme. I think if you run an enzymatic reaction, we have great um, Candida Antarctica, Mucormi, high lipases. We can, and, and, and enzymatic interest verifications are fantastic. Uh, you can do them at low temperatures, so you're not affecting very much. And at the end, if you're careful about it, you don't even have to refine the oil at the end too much unless you're gonna fry with it. Frying oils are a different beast altogether, right? They have to be super clean, low smoke point, almost no free fatty acids. But for most of our consumption, I think we can work with minimally processed oils of high nutritional value. Intersterification is possible, maybe blending them and you intersterifying them. And then the question is you can gel them maybe, but I wouldn't gel them with something too synthetic. It just depends where you wanna go with your product, right? But minimally, minimally processed oils, I think are an exciting prospect. Good. 
you know, the questions keep coming up. I think I, I, I would suggest reading at the last question and then maybe um, we can send these questions to Dr. Marangoni and he can reply because we've been answering questions for 20 minutes. I don't want Dr. Marangoni to be extra tired. So um, the next question is in Spanish, but I'm going to translate it. And uh, it says, is there uh, a way to search for edible oils that come from uh, plants that are sustainable? Is there any sustainable plants that can provide oils, edible oils? No, but, but, but having said that, you and your friends get together, get investors going, open your own facility. I think anybody setting up an expeller facility and having all those things line up would do very well in business. I think that it would start as a niche market, but who knows how much it will grow. Uh, the question is, I mean, maybe we should see sustainable and minimally processed canola. Oh, that's horrible with all the sulfur soy. There are products out there or sunflower is a good one uh, by expelling. Uh, no, you can't source these things very well. But for example, here in the Canada area in Barrie, just two hours north of here, there's a small producer of expelled virgin oils that are not olive oil. And uh, he's having a lot of success. They're so expensive. They're so expensive. So you're going to have to find a very good story to be able to sell your oils. But uh, no, large scale supply of these, it's totally possible. But people have to change their extraction and refining which is totally possible too. It's just how, I mean, the big guys who do all the extraction, is it worthwhile to them? Can you convince them that you're gonna have enough demand for these things? So that's why they're not available yet. Thank you, Alex. I think it's, it's fair to, uh, to end the presentation here and the questions. Uh, there are a few more questions left. And again, they, they keep coming. So I think, uh, we can forward those questions to you and somehow AOCS um, will help us get back to the um, people that are asking the questions. Is that, is that okay with you? Yeah, I mean, depending on, on other schedules of people, I mean, I have another like five minutes that I could, that I could do a couple quick ones if you want, or yeah, you okay. can send them to me if you want. Uh, okay, let's do a couple more then for another five minutes. Um, the next one is, uh, you mentioned the minimal processing as a trend and processing is very important to remove contaminants. Mm. Uh, will, we, will we be able to merge both minimal processing, uh, sorry, will we be able to merge both minimal processing oils contaminants? Excellent question, but here's a challenge for you. It's gotta be organic, pesticide free, and grown on soils that don't have a ton of mercury or like other things. So you check the heavy metals on your soil and you grow it organically, no problem. <laughs> Great. Um, next questions. Are there sufficient risks associated with the use of mono or diglycerides in the view of formation of glycidol or its, and its esters, ethers, sorry. Thank you very much for the question. I've been answering that question lately because we work with partial glycerides. So um, no problem if you're not heating up your oil to 250 degrees in a, in a, in a, in a, in a deodorized. So um, it the, the, if you look at the, the guidelines, I think above 150, 160 degrees, you start having the potential of forming them. So let's say you use enzymatic processes and you keep everything below 150 degrees, the formation of glycidyl esters and, uh, and MCPD are zero pretty much. So uh, yes, there is a concern. So you have to avoid the high temperatures. Great. Um, we have one more question. Uh, the cosmetic mar market uses a number of waxes you mentioned, but it is, it, it, it is melt point and rheology that are used to pick the waxes. Are there rheological studies and melt point data on more unusual waxes? Oh, I would love people to get into that. I mean, we always stick to uh, the idea that we've done is, uh, I'll tell you one that I would really like to see more. We stuck to sunflower, rice bran. There's tons of, and there's a few others. There's not that many others uh, just because of supply, right? Uh, but from um, but from an academic point of view, I, I haven't seen the sugarcane wax. Sugarcane wax at one point came really hard, and there should be quite a bit of sugarcane wax. I haven't seen any studies published on that. Maybe it's all locked down by some big company. But but no, no, the uh, the waxes from different sources. 
it could be interesting from an academic perspective for us to learn, uh, but uh, as w- then you have to go on the other side is like, and from a practical point of view, maybe it's not as interesting because there's three plants in the world, you know? Uh, so that, so that's maybe the reason that people haven't looked at more exotic waxes. The problem with waxes and many oleogelators that are natural is the purity though, because you may be doing a great study, studying all kinds of things about it, but let's say that you have higher fatty alcohols or fatty acid levels that are not the esters, right? Remember, waxes are this combination of products. So unless we know what we're analyzing, I've bought two different rice bran waxes that are completely different and they're the same rice bran wax. I have, I can sell you a rice bran wax that doesn't gel up to like 8% concentration. I do not know what to do with it. It costs me a lot of money. So, so before you go and get exotic waxes, maybe try to characterize what it is that you're analyzing. Yeah, I agree. I think there is a very interesting paper out there from USDA people that have published compared different, you know, like you said, rice bran wax and beeswax. I can't remember exactly. Sunflower, I think they did different sources and totally different properties. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have one more question. What about using flaxseed gums as gelator substances in formation of all your gels? Well, yes, the colloidal templates, uh, um, you can do many things with them. You can um, for example, uh, freeze dry them and use them to soak up oil, or you can stabilize your emulsions with that particular polysaccharide and then dry it down. We actually have seen some evidence of maybe even direct gelation of the flaxseed of the um, of the flaxseed gums. I think a lot of those polysaccharides that live within oil seeds have the potential to do more than just be a hydrogel, but also interact with um, with uh, w- with the oil directly. An open field. Can you have a, a, a polymer that is uh, both um, uh, forms a network in, in water, but also has oil binding capacity? You're on your own there. there there's, there's very little known about that. Sure. Well, thank you, Alex. That was the, the last question. I'm glad we continue. That's uh, all. But uh, AOCS just uh, reminded me that um, people that want to continue asking questions, they can contact Dr. Marangoni through their profile in the AOCS virtual meeting. So um, make sure to do that if there are any questions left over. And uh, with that, I will ask, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Marangoni for this very interesting presentation, awesome discussion. And also like to um, thank AOCS for organizing the virtual uh, meeting and this uh, live stream. Uh, Thank you very much all of you for being there and for uh, being so engaged.